Okay, hello and welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Costantino Grasso. I'm the editor-in-chief of the CSR and Business Ethics blog, which is a scientific online platform devoted to promoting the analysis and discussion of CSR issues around the world. It's an honor to launch the first seminar of the end of year series entitled CSR Whistleblowing and Human Rights that uh, it has been organized by a team composed of me and Dr. Don Carpenter from Georgetown University that is here in the panel, who is the national editor of the CSR blog for the United States of America, as well as Dr. Luca D'Ambrosio, who is the national editor for France. Luca will also be the discussant and moderator today. A special thank you for both, uh, to both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, the series will include six fascinating seminars, uh, starting with the one that will be given by Dr. Jasmine Montargemi uh, today. It's great to have you uh, with us today, Jasmine. I don't have other words, just great. Uh, before giving the floor to Luca, please allow me to thank the CFCI and its director, Professor Panagiotis Andrikopoulos, for its support, as well as the research team of Virtue, which is an EU-funded research project aimed at exploring the interconnection between corruption and tax evasion for being our precious partner. Uh, a thank you to all the audience that we have today. We have uh, already 33 attendees. Uh, your number is uh, honoring us and at the same time is stressing the importance of the discussion that we will have today. So thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, as I said, uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded and then published on the CSR blog as a digital CSR content with the exclusion of the question and answer time. So feel free to speak freely in the question and answer time. It won't be recorded. Uh, finally, uh, as regards the questions, um, if you have something to ask, you can just start uh, during the speech to write down in the chat uh, the question, so we can uh, start looking at that, and it uh, will be easier for us to give you the floor uh, during the question and answer time. That's a duty for Luca. So now I will give the floor to Luca. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Costantino. So hello, uh, everyone. Let me welcome you again to the first webinar of this end of year 2020 service. I'm very glad and honored to moderate this webinar presented by Jasmine Motaljemi and focusing on several issues such as corporate culture, risk management, lab of the law, and more broadly, whistleblower protection. Indeed, Jasmine Motaljemi uh, became a whistleblower, or as she prefers, a public health advocate. And she has been fighting for many years to receive justice in face of the corporation she worked for. And the fight is far from over, as Jasmine will tell us. But let me give you just a few elements about our speaker. Jasmine Motaljemi was a senior scientist and acting director of the World Earth Organization before joining in Estelle as a global food safety controller. As part of her work, Jasmine Motaljemi warned the management of the corporation about the health and life risks involving several products purchased all over the world by Nestlé. These warnings were not only ignored by Nestlé, the negligent managers were promoted, while Yasmin Motaljemi was isolated, harassed, and finally fired in 2010. From this moment, Yasmin Motaljemi started a struggle for justice and discovered the limits of the Swiss whistleblower protection system. But she also discovered the difficulties of receiving justice in face of big and powerful corporation. Awarded in 2019 of the Daphne Curana, Curana Galicia Prize for journalists, whistleblowers, and defenders of the right to information, Jasmine Motajemi carries in Europe and around the world the cause of whistleblowers protection and more broadly of corporate responsibility in fields of labor law, food safety, public health, and human rights. So I want to express all my gratitude to Jasmine Motajemi for accepting to share with us her valuable experience. It is really an, an honor for us, Jasmine. Thank you very much. So I will give the floor uh, to Jasmine for roughly half an hour, 
And then we will open the Q&A session uh, following the instruction given by Constantino. So do not hesitate to send even before your questions in the chat, and then we'll select them for Jasmine. So uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you again to everybody for being here with us today. And Jasmine, you have the floor. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Constantino, Luca, and Daphne. No, sorry, Dawn, uh, for um, giving me this opportunity to express my experience. Um, I would like also to thank all the attendees uh, for their interest in my presentation. So I will now try to share my uh, slide, few slides which I prepared. Um, <clears throat> and um, I wanted also to say that uh, this presentation is very timely because uh, many European countries are in the process of uh, transposing the EU directive on whistleblowing into their national legislation. And uh, perhaps this uh, presentation can make an input into that process. What I would like to demonstrate uh, through this presentation and the uh, account of my personal experience is how the labor law corporate culture, impact risk management. And when these are in the context of a multinational company or an inter international context, how they impact uh, globally, uh, the interest of public globally. At the same time, I would like to give you an insight into my battle for some fundamental values, uh, which are public health, human rights, justice, and many more. Among these, there is also freedom of opinion. Because what I have realized is that it's not only that employees don't have a freedom of speech, but today they don't even have a freedom of opinion. They have to follow the views and opinion of their uh, employer. Um, <clears throat> As you have understood, uh, my experience is in the area of uh, food safety management. Um, and uh, the, in 1990s, the World Health Organization recognized food safety as essential public health function. Therefore, uh, I'm here today speaking to you as a public health advocate. But uh, all the principles underpinning food safety management that I present here, they will also apply to other areas of risk management. Now, the points that I would like to make uh, are based on a case, my own case, which takes place in Switzerland and in the company, multinational company, Nestle. As you know, Nestle is one of the most powerful food company in the world. Now, to many of you, Switzerland might seem a small country, but um, diplomatically and most importantly, economically, it's a very important uh, country in the global community because it is um, home to many multinational companies. It is estimated that in Switzerland there is about um, there is more than two thousand uh, twenty five thousand Swiss multinational or um, foreign companies uh, subsidiary of foreign companies in Switzerland. Out of these, fourteen thousand of them are Swiss operated companies. In addition to these multinational companies, you have a large number of governmental or non governmental organizations. Uh, like you have the United Station, Nations World Health Organization, um, International Labor Organization, World Trade Organization, and many non-governmental organizations. From uh, their head office in Switzerland, this organization can manage the whole world. They can manage their operation in the whole world. And those uh, managers or executives who are working are based in Switzerland. They are fully aware of what these companies are doing abroad. 
They may even be participating in decisions um, or be in a position to veto some decisions which are uh, harmful for society. But they are subject to the Swiss labor law. So this creates a conflict of interest uh, because on the one hand, they are obliged to follow the national uh, legal context or comply it's in their interest to comply with the culture of their company. And on the other hand, by their decisions, their negligence or silence, uh, they may be taking risk for, uh, for populations worldwide. This is a situation that I faced uh, when working in Nestle. This, con um, this um, uh, conditions contribute that uh, many Swiss multinational companies are committing crimes or violation of human rights, abuse of environment um, abroad in other countries without their employees or managers oppose them or uh, report it. And uh, these multiple violations uh, have actually been recognized by a number of non-governmental organizations in Switzerland, as well as politicians, who have recently launched an initiative called the Responsible Business Initiative. And um, that they would like to bring these companies uh, and to bring them in front of the Swiss justice system. Uh, while this initiative have the merit to have identified the problem, unfortunately the solution that they are bringing is not very efficient for the reasons that you will see later on. Even the government uh, is opposing um, this initiative, unfortunately for the wrong reasons. They are um, objecting to forcing multinational companies to, com to comply with human rights abroad for the reason that this might be a bad for um, Swiss job market. So <clears throat> I know best um, the problems in uh, Nestle. Uh, Nestle has periodically been also ac accused of uh, violating human rights and environment abroad. And we know that Nestle has been viol violating laws uh, in a number of different areas. Now, from um, outside, uh, Nestle may look a very good company. It has certainly very good financial performance. From the perspective of visible quality, the products are also good. But for someone who has worked from inside for 10 years in Nestle, I have seen other realities, some troubling facts, which I will speak about them now. Now, because of the role of uh, Switzerland, which I just mentioned, in the global community, it is, uh, Switzerland is a good example uh, for examining how the laws of a country, the labor law, will impact uh, risk management. And let's focus on the issue of whistleblowing, which is the subject of this series of seminar and the EU directive. In Switzerland, there is no law for protection of whistleblower. A draft law was in the pipeline, but um, since 2008, but uh, just this year it has been turned down definitively because the, the proposed law was only regulating the process without providing any protection for whistleblowers. In addition, employees are prohibited to disclose information um, from the workplace, even if those information concerns wrongdoings uh, of their employer. When I was dismissed in 2010, in my letter of dismissal, I was warned that I'm not allowed to speak about what I had seen and experienced in the company. And this was one of the reasons I decided uh, to um, 
file a lawsuit against the company. Uh, in addition to this, um, harassment of uh, whistleblowers, or more generally speaking, employees, is tolerated uh, in Nestle and in, the, in Switzerland because there is no criminal law against harassment of employees. There is a very weak uh, embryonic civil law which says that personality of employees have to be respected. But this law is so ambiguous and leading to, um, and is leading to many arbitrary decisions because even judges have difficulties to interpret this law. And um, even if someone succeeds uh, to um, prove that the law has been violated, the civil law has been violated, there is no sanction for the employer who has been harassing the employee or the whistleblower. Unfair dismissal is also the factor made possible by the fact that the uh, sanctions are maximum six months salary, but in practice two or three months salary. You realize that for a multinational company to pay two or three months salary is um, basically uh, nothing, peanuts. And many companies, they offer this when they dismiss uh, their employees so that the employee have no case to uh, file a lawsuit. So when um, uh, the law is actually violated and uh, the employee has good reason to file a lawsuit, the problem is that the judicial system is very difficult is almost impossible for an employee to file a lawsuit against a multinational company. The process is very long and you can be sure that the employer will do everything to make it even longer because you can realize that a company who is violating the law, who is committing crimes, and in addition uh, is uh, harassing the whistleblower, he will not refrain itself from lying, from uh, using delaying tactic, tactics, to um, taking, to defaming, smearing the, the, the whistleblower in the court. And it's very complex. They will make it even more complex. Uh, it's very, very painful because very often the whistleblower is defamed and uh, smeared and discredited even more in front of the court. And then, um, <clears throat> and above all is very, very costly before, beyond your imagination, it is costly. And in addition, the judges are, uh, must be member of political parties and they're promoted by this. So their ruling is influenced by their political view and vice versa, their ruling may also influence their, re their re-election. The process provides a letter or no search for the truth. Witnesses in a civil law, as I experienced it, witnesses can lie in practice, even though theoretically is prohibited, but in practice they lie because the onus of uh, filing a lawsuit against the witness who has lied is on the victim. So you can realize that when the victim is already fighting against the multinational, it is very difficult for the victim to still make other lawsuits against 10, 20 victim, uh, witnesses who are lying. And of course, the employer knows this and will use it in order uh, to, uh, to win their case. And uh, this makes that uh, the employee is uh, almost alone in front of a mighty um, employer and the colleagues who are supporting the employer, particularly that the colleagues have been silent and complicit in the crime or wrongdoings. And the court also, the civil courts, will strongly encourage, encourage uh, mediation and out-of-court settlement. With out-of-court settlement, of course, there is no naming and shaming of the employer, and the employer gets a 
really carte blanche to continue with their practices. Uh, <clears throat> there might also be a victim might be subject to retaliation in form of judicial harassment. And even if they win their court case, like in my case, the compensation that they may get is so derisory that um, the losses is far exceeding the cost. Um, sorry, the, um, exceeding the compensation that they will get. So with this, filing a lawsuit against a multinational company, uh, the victim will suffer more and will be subject to a greater loss. And that's why many don't. I'd like to give you a taste of justice. Um, recently, an employee who was subject to psychological harassment filed a lawsuit, and he, uh, she went up to the level of federal court. And each level, this is what she got as an answer. You have not been harassed long enough. It should have been more, more than six months before you can actually um, you should deserve justice. You were well paid, so you should have accepted the harassment. You were not the only one to be harassed, or your harassment was not severe enough, although you have been humili humiliated, mistreated, and so on, and the, the victim had lost all motivation to look for another job. Uh, to the point that uh, you see uh, even the newspaper writes that the federal court authorized has harassment in Switzerland. So um, when uh, the legal and uh, justice system is such uh, that it gives uh, impunity to, to the employer, of course the employer have all the rights and the power um, and the employees have basically no rights. The first time I reported mismanagement uh, to the, I mean, I was alerting to an acceptable situation to the, um, to the uh, human resource uh, department, they asked me to withdraw my request and my complaint. They said, here in Nestle, the boss is always right. My dismissal was also uh, motivated um, by the fact that I had a difference of opinion with my management. Well, just for a difference of opinion, without even examining what those difference of opinion was. Uh, well, I think this is a very authoritarian uh, style of management. A situation which um, is reminding uh, of the Costa Concordia uh, cruise ship which sunk because the captain was actually incompetent. I have proven that my, my boss was actually uh, incompetent and was endangering public health. So in conditions where employees have no right, uh, they will of course uh, will remain silent, and those who have no ethics and they can, influ they are influential or um, they are corruptible. They are those who will uh, climb the ladder of hierarchy. It was um, during my court case. Many of victims who lied in the court were afterwards uh, promoted uh, in the job. So. When, uh, if you consider the justice has three objectives, repair damages, prevent the recurrence of violation or crime, and deter the, the spread of this violence and corruption and crime in the society. When the response is that there is no condemnation, no sanction, no compensation for the victims. So where is the justice for the victims? Where is the incentive to do better? And what are the lessons for other companies? <coughs> this led that another journal wrote, the federal court reinforces infinity of uh, employers. However, beyond uh, the national context, there is also corporate culture that determines the management style. By corporate culture, I mean all those unwritten rules promoted by management by their own practice. <clears throat> like unfair and discrimination, threats, fear culture, lying, deceit, harassment, bullying, 
and less, less uh, risk taking, taking and negligence. As a consequence, as a consequence of this corporate culture, which I experienced in Nestle, and I have proved it through my court case, and I can give you many examples if you ask me. Uh, what happens is that uh, um, employees are more thinking about their own interests than about the interests of society and consumers. I recall that once I was telling to my colleague that what you have written is wrong, and he was a colleague in the food safety department of the company in the cockpit. He said, I don't care as long as I have my salary. And when I was trying to uh, fight for food safety failures, which I was, uh, I was observing, my administrative assistant brought me the sculpture of the three wise monkeys. Uh, you, uh, you should not see and not hear and not speak of, speak up. And this, and I have heard these things and much more. And this was the ethics of my uh, colleagues in the company. Now, the Nestle trial uh, provide um, some ins insight uh, into the practice of uh, Nestle company. Um, and let's see how this company culture applies uh, in the context of whistleblowing and risk management, as whistleblowing is a key element of risk management. As you know, the EU directive and also the uh, national legislation in many countries requiring that some companies above um, a certain number of employees should have an internal whistleblowing system. And the New York Stock Exchange also uh, requires this uh, after the Enron case is requiring this for companies. And Nestle developed one such an um, internal whistleblowing system, at least on the paper. And uh, since 2007, they have this Nestle Code of Business Conduct. And let's see what they say in this code. They say, Nestle respect uh, the personal uh, dignity and priv uh, privacy and personal rights of employees and is committed to maintain a workplace free, uh, free from discrimination and harassment. It uh, further says that any failure to comply with this code may result in disciplinary action, including possibility of dismissal and if warranted legal proceeding and criminal sanctions. Uh, moreover, they say all complaints should be properly investigated. Nestle prohibits retaliation against any employee. So these are what Nestle officially reports uh, uh, in their public documents, but let's see how they reacted to my whistleblowing. Well, I started my work in 2000. For a number of years, I was just trying to do my work and alerting on food sa safety failures and sometimes um, deliberate negligence, we'll discuss it later on. Um, and then when I saw the situation were out of hand, I started to do my whistleblowing internally. And I asked for an audit of food safety management. I didn't even impose my views. I said, you should come and see yourself what's happening in our department. How did Nestle respond? Refused to audit for food safety, which I think for a food company is totally unacceptable. They started my harassment. They attempt to force me into a side job, which in French you call it a closet position. They threatened me. After three years and a half of harassment, only under my insistence, they accepted to do an investigation to my harassment, which turned out to be fake. It was a sham investigation. Totally unacceptable for a company who claims business excellence. And finally, they dismissed me for a difference of opinion in food safety management without even examining those differences of opinion. And there were no disciplinary measures against those responsible. And then in addition, they uh, offered me money 
in order not to file a lawsuit, I keep silence and not report what I have seen, which of course refused. So during uh, four years, uh, during the first six years, I had, um, I did, I was doing my work and I had excellent performance. Uh, but then in 2006, when things turned to be particularly bad, I started to uh, report all the level of hierarchy with giving the necessary time to each director to, to do something. And they did nothing, just nothing. And I went up to the chairman of the board and my let letter to Mr. Peter uh, Brabeck uh, is on internet. You can search it and you can find this. Um, and because I, even though I was dismissed, I felt that I should brief him about what has been happening in this company. Also wrote to, to the CEO and to director of corporate governance with a recommended letter. They all just refused to examine the food safety failures that I was concerned with. And in addition, uh, the, um, the CEO of the company, that time CEO today, president, uh, the, the chairman of the board, he went and discredited me in the media by giving an interview to the editor of the reference newspaper uh, in Switzerland by saying that I have been acting of personal interest. And there has been 5,000 employees who have um, um, ethics and professionalism, and we are overlooking their professionalism and, et professionalism and ethics. And why are you listening to Yasmin? Now I will show you what has been this, the ethics of these 5,000 employees of Nestle. The court uh, confirmed that there has been under, uh, there has been an underhanded, insidious harassment, uh, which has really destroyed my brilliant career, and which has subjected me to a serious suffering of very intense and lengthy for a, um, with a lengthy and intense um, bullying and harassment. In addition, uh, they say that despite of the seriousness of the situation, which and my numerous complaints, they took no actions. And they also confirmed that the investigation that they conducted was sham and another act of harassment. Now, this time, not by my boss, but by the top management of the company, by the director of corporate governance, the one who is supposed to make sure that the company is acting according to laws and internal policies. And they also confirmed that my uh, colleagues, um, the other managers, were complicit in these actions. This is the ethics of Nestle employees that Mr. Bulke was referring to. Now I would like to finish by taking you to the my world of food safety and to explain how the corporate culture is influencing risk management. Now, during the last uh, three decades, we have had numerous food safety crises. You may remember some of them. And this food safety crisis has made that we have learned our lesson and we have improved the food safety management system and we have made a very big sophisticated machinery how to make food safety work. And I have participated in the elaboration of the food safety management system uh, because actually this was during my career period. And this is why I could see the failures of Nestle. Uh, and in, in the and in a food company, uh, this uh, system of food safety assurance is based on three layers of defense. Uh, two layers, prevention, and one is verification. So if anything is wrong in the layers of prevention, the verification can pick up this. This 
uh, but this good, strong, robust system of food safety management makes that if there is an error in uh, one of these layers, it's not sufficient to cause an incident. So when incidents happen, it's usually consequence of a, a number of failures or mm, gaps in our system. And um, this, we have to realize that how and why these gaps happen. This gap happens because somewhere human beings who are supposed to do their work or to decide about something, they are not doing their job properly. They are either violating or they are making errors or they are negligent. So, but these human beings, why would they do this? This is because of the company culture and the conditions under which they have to work. And this comes because of managerial decisions. The, the, the errors that they, uh, these uh, employees do is called, um, whether errors or violation, they are called active failures. And these company culture conditions that we create for them, because it will take time before uh, they actually show their influence, we call them latent uh, failures. Now, <clears throat> let's see how this concept applies to one among many, many failures and incidents for which I've been fighting uh, and for which Nestle has been implicated um, works. You may remember that in 2007, in the United States, there was a big uh, crisis incident with pet food, which was contaminated with the chemical substance melamine. Melamine was added to wheat gluten imported from China to falsify the protein content of the wheat gluten. And this was toxic for animals, and hundreds of cats and dogs died, and Nestle products were also implicated in this major incident. Okay. Now, um, usually when a company has an incident, and that's the way I was handling uh, food safety and crisis before I, uh, I was subject to harassment, uh, a company is supposed to make a survey of its product to make sure that this contaminant does not happen in any other product, particularly in the market um, where the contaminant is originating, that means here, China. Uh, but um, to my knowledge, uh, which I was observing, Nestle did nothing, just nothing. And uh, a year later, uh, in uh, China, some 300,000 babies got intoxicated again with melamine, this time in infant formula and um, at least six uh, infants died. Now, in this uh, incident, Nestle claims that they were not the cause of the intoxication because they claim that the level of contamination of their product were not uh, high enough in order to cause an, an acute intoxication. So the intoxication has been officially been attributed to another company, Chinese company, Sandlu. However, the Nestle products were also contaminated. We have confirmation that they were contaminated at trace level or um, slightly above regulatory levels. Um, and so what we don't know, it is uh, from the year they found out that they knew that their products were contaminated, or no, sorry, the year they knew that there was this risk in China, to, uh, to the year later when there was this intoxication, Nestle does not have any data to show that their products were safe. And we don't know what level of contaminants were in the product. And if you expose a child to low levels, but for a long time, what are the health consequences of on, on, uh, children? I have internal emails which says that in South Africa, products were heavily contaminated and were withdrawn. The problem is that this, the role of Nestle in this intoxication was not properly 
uh, investigated. But um, more importantly, what I want to say that if Nestle had managed its food safety as it should have, that means if it had tested its product and if it had detected that their products were contaminated, and as uh, I usually would have recommended that they had reported to the authorities, they could, we could have, Nestle could have prevented this huge outbreak of um, uh, melamine in China. And I say, what is the biggest corporate social responsibility for a food company other than participating in uh, ensuring that the food supply is safe? Um, in another outbreak which happened in the United States with uh, Peanut Corporation of America, uh, where 700 um, consumers were, uh, well, fell sick with uh, salmonella, nine died. Well, Nestle had audited this company and knew that this company, uh, Peanut Corporation of America, was working under unsanitary conditions. But it just went away and left this company to sell its raw material products to other companies. And other companies got into a trouble. And Nestle said, oh, we are a good company because we didn't use this supplier. But they did let other company use this supplier and consumer get sick. So um, now people, everyone knows the melamine incident from outside, but let's have a look what happened in Nestle when I was the food safety manager when this incident was happening. Well, let's go back from the year 2000 to 2005. This was the, my honeymoon period with Nestle, where I was trying to, to dig out the failures, to improve the correct the failures. But in this period, I confronted some cases of a willful negligence, where, um, um, <clears throat> where uh, biscuits which were too hard for infants was left on the market and babies were uh, choking with these baby biscuits. And consumers were complaining that our baby uh, were suffocating, it, this product is very dangerous and so on. And we had our baby got blue, we had to turn the baby to get out the biscuit, to put our fingers into her throat to get it out. Um, and there was this director uh, of quality in Nestle France who was receiving these consumer complaints, but he was doing nothing except putting, leaving the product on the market. In another issue, we had an uh, infant formula and they were asking me to, uh, um, to certify the specification for macronutrients, but there were absolutely no calculation whether the levels of macronutrients in infant form formula were correct or not. And I was refusing to sign this. And as a result, they just signed, they just changed this, uh, the route of signature so that I don't get to sign. And in both cases, I was alerting the management that this was is happening is not correct. So my, uh, I was fighting in these periods of 2000 to 2005 in, in the context of my work. But in 2005, we had major incident. One was, uh, despite of my alerts about macronutrients in infant formula, Nestle was releasing infant formula in, um, with um, iodine in excess of regulatory standards of China. And this made a huge, a scandal in China, and Nestle lost 30% of the market share. Another uh, crisis was uh, that there was traces of ink in um, a chemical coming from the ink of the packaging in the infant formula. And my boss, who was at that time actually a good man, he decided to recall the products from the market. Uh, although this uh, chemical was not very... Uh, did not present a significant health to risk, but he did it for consumer confidence case. This made that Mr. Brabeck, 
uh, the at that time CEO of the company got mad why we were recalling this product. And he decided for the policy to link bonuses to product withdrawal. That means if you withdraw products from the market, you will be penalized with your bonus. At the same time, they dismissed the director who had recalled products and they promoted who? The director who was uh, the mm, director of quality who was implicated in the case of baby biscuits and macronutrients specifications and uh, in, in infant formula. So, and he became my boss. This was the person I, with whom I had some encounter and conflict on food safety management. And from there on, he started his um, retaliation, bullying and harassment. And he was blocking my instructions and among others instruction on chemical contaminants. And he was also issuing erroneous instructions like you do not need to test uh, the raw matter for chemical contaminants. While most of our incidents were coming with uh, uh, contamination of raw material like the melamine case. So this led uh, first uh, to a first incident of melamine in United States in 2007. And then again, another incident of melamine uh, in 2008 where our products had to be recalled um, you might say that they were, um, didn't cause intoxication, acute intoxication, but we don't know their long-term health effect. But um, because it was also uh, taking the whole issue of uh, choking lightly, a child died in 2008 of choking, but with another product. Uh, it was a sausage. Another child again died in 2009. And I was also fighting for better communication of risk uh, to consumers. Uh, he will also neglected all my instructions and my advice. This led us to another outbreak of E. coli 157 in the United States, where 77 persons got ill with this killing um, bacteria. By 2012, uh, four children had died and one uh, suffered from severe sequelae from a choking. And, and still Nestle uh, challenged the parents and the parents had to go to court to get some um, very slight uh, um, uh, compensation for the handicapped child, but there was no sanction against this company, no sanction. And uh, in 2020, I finally succeeded to condemn Nestle for harassment uh, for uh, my, uh, my harassment, the harassment of the food safety manager, but there was no sanction. So i like to finish uh, by making an autopsy uh, of this incident of uh, melamine and to show to you how the company culture, which is um, characterized, characterized by bullying will impact risk management. So there were many failures, as I explained to you, in management of melamine uh, from our side, which if we had managed better melamine in our material, we could have prevented the intoxication in China. And then uh, this was because, um, this is actually a root cause analysis, uh, if we had, uh, this was because they had appointed a director uh, which was lacking competence uh, and he was negligent in food safety management and he was um, taking retaliation against previous cases. And um, they also just uh, failed to follow up on my internal whistleblowing and all these things were possible because of the company culture, of uh, nepotism, fear culture, harassment, discrimination, that I can report it also in the court. And then um, we have um, inappropriate manager decisions and structure who promoted actually a man who was known for his negligent attitude, but, um, this was um, 
and then they fired the person who was fighting for consumer and reputation of the company. And uh, why all these things is happening uh, in a company? Because we have a weak uh, regulatory system. Uh, Nestle came to court and made fun of the judicial system, as you can see in my letter, which I wrote to the CEO of uh, Nestle, Mr. Schneider. You can find this letter on internet. Uh, there was no, uh, the regulatory authorities, despite of all my letters, no investigation in the food safety management. They were not interested to learn how Nestle is responding uh, to, in the court. There were no sanctions um, for uh, the harassment. In the 10 years that I worked in Nestle, there was never inspection how Nestle um, management uh, is managing food safety in its office, how they manage emerging hazard, how they manage crisis. Uh, in the 10 years um, that I was there, even when we had incidents, never uh, any authority came to investigate up to the level of management why we had this incident. And as a matter of fact, I wrote to the uh, US authorities, to FDA, and I told them that when there is an incident, you should look into the responsibility of the management. I was the food safety manager, so you should interrogate me. You should hold me responsible until I can prove you that I am not responsible. And they just didn't reply. So where I stand, uh, I, from 2000 and 2020, I have, had a, I have had many lawsuits. I made a lawsuit against Nestle, the ANAXA, the litigation insurance company. The, um, Nestle made a lawsuit against me for disclosure of my case to the media. Um, the pension fund also made a lawsuit against me. Um, for um, claiming that I am lying and I am not being affected by this incident. And um, <clears throat> there, in the whole process, there were eight different complaints uh, and from, the, from Nestle and delaying tactics, uh, which I have won all. And I'm still uh, in the court procedure because Nestle is refusing uh, to recognize his responsibility and to compensate for me for my losses, uh, even my judicial costs. Even the court has said, confirmed that they have been um, guilty of violating the Swiss law. So <clears throat> I don't know if I win at the end and how long it will take and if I will still be alive by that time. But I know one thing, that not all battles are fought for victory. Some are fought simply to tell the world that someone was there on the battlefield, as Ravish Kumar, an Indian journalist, said. So I am, I am just doing this battle for my values. Thank you, Jasmine, for for this presentation, which is uh, impressive and, and really touching. Thank you a lot. So uh, I have so many questions and remarks about your presentation, but I think that we won't have time to, uh, if, uh, if we want uh, to give some time to, to the question and answer, then we have uh, pretty much questions. Uh, I mean, I, I will just limit myself to a question. Um, to the following question. You said that uh, one of the main problems of, uh, of this case, I mean, or, or, of, uh, of the, 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 the Nestlé affair, uh, the, this case that uh, involved you war, uh, was uh, the um, failure of uh, regulatory initiatives on the risk assessment proceedings of Nestlé. There were no remedies, and basically uh, the management uh, uh, could do whatever you want. 
he wanted. So my question is, um, do you think that the um, initiatives on mandatory due diligence can um, fail this gap and avoid that uh, the failure that you described uh, will uh, be reproductive in the future? When it's, I'm talking about mandatory due diligence initiatives, I'm, talking, I, I'm thinking about the French law on the loi de vigilance and uh, the other initiatives uh, um, which, are, which have been discussed, uh, are now discussed at the European Union level that um, give a, a legal framework to corporations uh, for improving uh, due diligence principles that are um, based on the um, UN principles uh, on uh, business and human rights. So do you think that these initiatives might um, um, avoid in the future uh, the uh, negligence and the failures such as those you presented today? Well, um, uh, first of all, Switzerland is not part of the European community. So whatever is happening within European Union does not apply to Switzerland. And that's why many multinational companies are coming to Switzerland. And even in, in one of the interviews, the interview that I showed, uh, Mr. Buke said that if Switzerland make a tighter law uh, for, um, for whistleblowing, um, they will quit uh, Switzerland. They, I mean, they said that in a very subtle way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why also uh, the government is against the responsible um, business initiative because they are afraid that multinational companies uh, will leave uh, Switzerland. So Switzerland is the paradise for companies mm -hmm. to come here and do whatever they want in the world. Uh, unless, unless... Uh, European countries uh, um, who are now adopting the EU directive, they will allow also um, <clears throat> employees from um, Swiss multinationals seek justice in their country and also provide them judicial support because very often employees uh, who have lost their job, they don't have uh, the financial resources to, to have a lawyer. And very often, at least I also know in Switzerland, many lawyers are very uh, afraid to go against multinational companies. Not many do. Uh, so um, <clears throat> that is the issue. And this is actually one of the recommendations which I am making to the uh, <clears throat> Uh, European countries in during the transposition of the EU directive that please um, also consider the um, transnational risk that means risk from companies who are outside of European Union and this actually they can do it also in different ways either that employees who are outside the European Union uh, they can uh, seek justice in the European uh, countries, or that European countries, they ask uh, countries who are exporting to their market to have a whistleblowing protection law. Um, I mean, uh, exporting better products or services. Uh, so, because uh, in, um, in the area of food safety, many countries didn't have certain system of food safety management. And what important countries they did, they said, if you don't, if you want us to import your products, and that's what European Union did actually with African countries and Asian countries. They said, if you want us to import your products, you should have this and this and this system of risk management. And since whistleblowing is a part of risk management, so we can imagine that EU countries require Switzerland or other 
exporting countries mm -hmm. to have a whistleblowing protection law, which is uh, similar or equivalent to to EU directive. But um, two other things which I think is also important. One is uh, that because when I am reporting uh, a crime of a Swiss uh, company to uh, Swiss authorities, of course, the judges are, are under conflict of interest because of the system which uh, I mentioned. So what we need is that uh, inter multinational companies, particularly when it comes to violating whistleblowing um, principles, should be um, judged by an cr international uh, criminal court. Because when a whistleblower reports um, a failure, dysfunction in the system to its management and the management refused to, uh, to follow up, a priori, you cannot know if it is a one child who will die or 300,000 people will die. We don't know. It's a, and whether it will, or nothing will happen. Uh, I consider not following whistleblowing principles is criminal. And when it comes to multinational company, it's a crime against any country because the, the consequence can be in any country, as I mentioned to you here. So it should be a criminal court judging uh, companies. And um, a final thing, which I think would be very important, uh, is to make internal policy binding. Uh, because today, the internal policy are basically uh, marketing, um, marketing tools uh, and they come and say anything but uh, they are not binding and this is something which has to be brought in the transposition of uh, EU directives and since you are asking me about also the EU initiatives I would like to say something else about these uh, EU directives unfortunately even though I did report to uh, European Parliament um, about my case. They never considered um, my experience and they based the EU directive on financial uh, whistleblower whistleblowers. Um, but if you look at my experience, you can see that when the EU directive says, oh, a company can have three months uh, to respond to a complaint, whistleblowing complaint. Well, in three months, people have died. <laughs> Environment is contaminated. It's just ridiculous. Uh, uh, you know, in France, in Ardennes, there was environmental pollution by Nestle, and it was three hours that the um, Nestle was pouring wastewater in the environment in the river. Ten, tons of fish died. So we cannot wait until uh, three months. And then another three months by the government. Another point was that in the, my court, managers were just um, passing the responsibility one to the other, that it was his responsibility, his responsibility to follow up. It was not clear whose responsibility it was. Yeah. And they said, well, because in Nestle, top managers, they don't, have definition of responsibilities. If there is no definitions of responsibilities, how can you t uh, take who is responsible and who should go to jail? And th they have a very flu, uh, nebulous management without clarification of responsibilities, so that when something happens, nobody knows who's responsible. <laughs> and there is no record keeping. And that's also another weakness of the EU directive. There is no re record keeping. There is no records from Nestle. All the records that I provided to the court were notes that I made. I made in my emails, my, my, um, my notes for the records. Nestle never made a record that we had this meeting and this was the decision. So we should also make them uh, to 
to, to list the complaints, to have a record of how each complaint has been handled, how fast, how well, mm -hmm. uh, how should be the investigation carried about, because they made a fake investigation where none of my witnesses, none of my documents were examined. At the end, four person who had never met me, mm -hmm. never met me, made the uh, judgment that there was no, no uh, harassment. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin, for this, uh, for your answer. Uh, you touched, I mean, uh, several points uh, that can explain uh, co corporations' impunity. I cannot reply, I'm sorry. I, I, um, I will give the floor to Dawn first, uh, then to Costantino. And um, can I just ask you to um, maybe to have shorter answers because we, uh, we have many questions and not so much time. Sorry. So, Dawn, you have the floor. Yasmin, thank you um, for all of this, not only sharing your story today, but living this experience for a good portion of your professional life, and, and that is very admirable and um, heroic, so I want to offer that to you. Um, but I have a question that haunts me, um, which is, why do you think that your colleagues at Nestle responded this way? Do you think it was um, driven by economic considerations? Uh, was it driven towards self-preservation for future litigation? Um, was it um, uh, negligence um, and pride for not wanting to admit mistake? Um, do you have any sense? Um, and I ask this question because um, I wonder if it is helpful in the context of uh, other whistleblowers who, who may be out there who might be able to better understand these types of motivations. Uh, do you mean after that I left, they, they behaved like this, they, they abandoned me? Or is that during which they remained silent? During. During. Um, because they were coming and telling me that, yes, I mean, you are right. Uh, I hope we will hope that you win. I remember when I was leaving, I, I told them, I wish you courage. And they told me, they told me, we saw what happens to those who have courage. Um, they were telling me, oh, uh, in this company only, we need a scandal before the management um, um, wake up. So basically because they are afraid of losing their job, uh, Nestle gives a good salary to companies and they give stock options. So this is a, some sort of a, um, a long-term loyalty scheme. And... They have their life, and they won't. They don't want to uh, to lose their comfortable life, and that's it. And they are afraid because they know that uh, if they speak up, uh, they will be subject to the same harassment that I experienced. Now, in court, they came. Even my friends came to court and lied, and this was uh, very painful for me. But one employee, only one, one of my colleagues came to court and said, what Yasmin endured was unbearable. I could have never, never stand this. But, and then she said, but I am very ashamed to say, to say that I also participate in this game. I also did it. And I'm ashamed to say it today. So they participate in this game but they are afraid. Um, I, I, I know I'm supposed to give short answer, but this story, um, this story is very important. They, they had made a ice cream and they had changed the stick into ice cream, which was usually a wooden stick, and they had put a glass stick and um, uh, with um, changing colors and in order to, to have a promotional material for ch children. And of course, we in the center, we said, no, absolutely not, you're crazy. And then in the workshop, I told them that, uh, to, to, to the ice cream manager, I said, how could you have Im ever imagined such a product to put glass in the mouth of children? And then there was a guy who raised his hand and said, well, we were many who objected, but we were fired. That's what happens to people who object. 
Did I answer your question? <laughs> Sadly, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Jasmine, it was amazing your presentation. Of course, it was an honor to have you. It's the best kickstart ever that you could have in this uh, seminar series. You touched so many important things. Uh, we don't have time. So I would like just you to uh, expand very briefly because you focus a lot on the judicial system. You focused a lot on the corporate culture, important elements. But what I would like you to expand a bit is what was the societal uh, response? I mean, what was the response of your colleagues? Uh, what was the response of the NGOs? What was the response of the media? If you can tell us about this in a, briefly, because there are so many questions, so we have to go through them. Thank you very much, Jasmine, again. It's fantastic to have you with us. Thank you. Well, for the NGOs, it's easy, uh, because um, they were basically uh, whistleblowing international network win which gave me a support um, <clears throat> by at least acknowledging my ba battle and responding to requests for help whenever I asked them. Uh, Multiwatch also perhaps gave me a little hand but other than these two organizations um, basically no other organization helped me as far as I recall and I hope it is correct. Um, I was really, really shocked uh, by the idea that uh, no NGO, those fighting for human rights, those NGOs who are right now making the responsible multinational um, initiative, not being interested to, into what I have to say, but worse, the professional technical NGOs or technical media. Technical media, that means those journalists were writing for food journals, nothing. That was so shocking for me. Even though when I reported to them, nothing. And uh, the international reference media, um, basically, uh, I can just say Financial Times, which has made a small article, unfortunately also uh, wrongly, uh, with the wrong title and wrong content, um, and this design. That's it. Uh, mm, there were perhaps one or two small articles elsewhere. But the Swiss media made something, uh, made some articles, but the problem is that their articles, uh, the, the events that they were reporting were either that the CEO is coming to the court, that was the major event for them, and, and then Nestle has been condemned. But they didn't go and analyze the management of Nestle and what has happened in the area of food safety. And they didn't ever try to question the management of Nestle, to interview them, to say, how is this possible, the way you have been behaving? What are the consequences? Consumer organizations... Uh, my network... Um, just abandoned me, um, except for two or three pe persons from my... I had some thousands of people in my network. I had only two or three people left um, out of those thousand people that I knew. I, I, this is as short as I could make it. Before uh, uh, opening the discussion, I will stop the recording. So uh, thank you so much, Jasmine, for this. Now we stop the recording and the question and answer time will go without recording. Thank you very much. Thank you okay. for being with us. Thank you.